Hello, everybody. Thank you so much, uh, A Tire Pie, for having us tonight. And thank you for every single person who is attending. We're really excited to share this labor of love called Seeking Plural Narratives uh, with Lisa, uh, which is basically about connecting and collaborating with students on graphic design histories. My name is Dina Bembrahim. I'm an Arab uh, creative and also educator at uh, University of Buffalo in uh, New York. Um, yeah. <laughs> and my name is Lisa Mayoni. I am a half Japanese uh, mixed designer, typographer, and educator based in Kansas City, Missouri. And I teach at Kansas City Art Institute. Imagine you're starting off studying design. You're a young student, an emerging graphic designer. And at this early stage, what would it be like to be introduced from day one to an expansive, globally oriented graphic design histories through an inquiry led, inclusive lens? And furthermore, not limited by a textbook nor limited by what one can find on a cursory Google search. Today, we wanna walk you through our work of facilitating these processes with our students. We'll share the inception of the idea, some design research methods we've incorporated, some in-process student outcomes, and our learnings as we work with our students and uh, as we work with our students this fall, and as we plan for further iterations of the project. So let's begin how it all got started. So it happens that Lena, Lisa, and I are actually really big type nerds, and uh, we. Uh, naturally met in Alphabet, which is an awesome community of women identifying type nerds, scholars, and enthusiasts. Um, I actually po posted a message on our Slack just asking if there would be any volunteers to come to my class, uh, do any talk or do a workshop or anything to just, you know, inspire my students. And with Lisa, it just became a much more substantial conversation on basically how to make our students collaborate together and um, kind of create a more enriching experience for them. Yeah, it turned out we were both interested in inclusive, student-centered, inquiry-based approaches to teaching, and in particular, activating graphic design histories in the studio-based programs. Um, after exchanging some emails um, and getting to know each other a little bit, we decided that Dina's typographic systems course and my graphic design histories course would be a compatible group to do something together. In collaborating, we asked ourselves, how might we integrate design research methods um, to connect our students through design histories? How might these students learn from one another along the way, as well as make something together by the end of the term? We were inspired by and influenced by a lot of different projects, but no matter what, we wanted to make sure that we would um, incorporate a sense of collaboration as well as a sense of agency. So overall, we're incorporating an inclusive and expansive lens on graphic design and um, in teaching and learning history in a more workshop-like manner. Uh, we've been inspired by history's projects such as Parallel Narratives, books like um, uh, Data Portraits by W.E.B. Du Bois, Natural Enemies of Books, The People's Graphic Design Archive, and resources like Decentering Whiteness and Design History. All of this research has been uh, act, uh, has been contributing to our work as professors, as well as contributing to the kind of research our students can do. Um, we really see research as a creative practice um, and creative practice as a type of research. At KCAI, Kansas City Art Institute, our graphic design histories class is less like a liberal arts course and more like a histories workshop. Research, note-taking, sharing, writing, speaking, designing, layout and presentation, it's all considered an integrated activity. It's not theory, it's a research practice of critical making. We work in a collaborative manner, allowing discussions and activities bring us to different topics, questions and considerations as we connect what we know with what we're studying. Being creative as a researcher, that's something that uh, we both believe we wanted to instill in our students within this project. 
even how to search for information. That's a creative, uh, it's a creative activity. The language that we use in the search bar is, is something that we, um, that we can get better at and, and hone as a skill of crea in creative language use. Um, how might we get something that you don't know what you're asking for? Um, be it in libraries, digital archives, collections, online search engines, use bookstores, interviews, and conversations. How do we wonder and wander into what we'd like to know? Um, coming to know what kinds of terms, words, uh, terminology, eras, categories, and subjects of interest, um, as we talk about that in class, that helps shape the way that each of our students searches and finds and searches through what they find. And similarly, at the University of Buffalo, we actually believe that we don't design in a vacuum. And so there is an active effort um, in uh, framing studio practices within historical context, which means that history should not only be taught uh, in history courses. So as we've been working, we've been thinking about what kinds of design research methods would help and support our students. Um, and as we conceived of the project, we we're thinking that you know we'd begin. Each student would begin with what they know. They'd coordinate and collaborate with one another. With one another, um, look at primary resources that we'd um, that we'd start them off with. They compile references, edit, um, and find a story that they're interested in, um, and be able to share that with the larger community, as well as be able to reflect on that process both for their own within their own practices as well as together mm -hmm. as a class. Of course, that process is a little bumpier than that. Um, there's nervousness, there's um, getting to know people that they don't know yet, there's figuring out what an archive is and libraries and um, trying to understand where and how one can find and research things. So those have definitely been part of the ride with our students thus far. Um, this kind of attitude uh, or this kind of development of an attitude around research, again, research as a creative practice, research not as something that is just about getting citations together um, and, um, uh, and writing papers about them, but research as a type of creative act, um, research as something that generates more interesting um, points of uh, questions and thoughts and that the students can experience uh, the, the different kinds of ways that research can manifest uh, uh, within their within their work at school. And within this frame, we actually asked the question of how might we define the sources of research, which means what is authoritative and what's unofficial? Where do we actually look? How do we extend how we look and where we're looking? Uh, how do we research as individuals, but also as partners? And kind of to answer these questions, we needed to demystify what research is because essentially it can happen or it can seem to be super overwhelming at that level, really. Um, and we needed to do that so that students can develop and practice research methods uh, so that they can search and find out about uh, design and typographic history um, by utilizing local, uh, regional, international uh, resources and also digital archives. Um, and that way they would be able to question, write, uh, and share knowledge through really meaningful collaboration. So to get them started, we shared with them multiple resources uh, from all over the world, really, um, from the Chinese Type Archive to the Khat Foundation to readings like The Women Behind Times New Roman by Alice Savoy. Um, and essentially, uh, this little kit that we prepared uh, just uh, to kind of spike their curiosity, help them in uh, framing how to look for resources. And that means you start with a topic and uh, number one step is about finding or focusing on academic materials like books or journal papers, um, uh, lectures, anything that would be really academic. And then we can extend it to the digital world where we have uh, websites, online publications, blogs, videos, uh, time-based media, anything that is in that realm can actually also offer meaningful insights. And in the third step, um, we encourage them to look at people who are actually researching the same thing, but they are removed from the research uh, for a particular reason. Um, 
uh, oftentimes there are critics or collaborators uh, that can offer really meaningful information uh, about that particular topic that they're researching. Um, we also encourage them to um, attend particular events or talks, uh, like the Type Weekend Conference. Uh, we uh, organize virtual field trip. In here, we can see the Linda Hall Library. Uh, we also have uh, invited uh, guests to inspire them, uh, like uh, Irina Koryajina that we can see uh, in here with students. Um, and at the same time, just for the sake of having something to start the discussion with, once they meet their research partner uh, partners, we assigned uh, required readings. Um, we assigned, can we teach uh, graphic design history without the cult of hero worship by Aggie Toppins. We assigned good history, bad history by Coleman, Miller and Jacobs. And then we also assigned design as an attitude by Alice Rothorn. Um, and they had to uh, create this uh, amazing and beautiful mix of hand drawings, uh, doodles and um, visual elements so that they would be able to connect the thesis of the main readings, uh, bring the main arguments as well, a couple of examples, and really anything that stood out to them, uh, and bring this visual to the discussion and be like, oh, well, this is what I found out. Oh, really, you saw this this way, but I saw it this other way, and just create a really meaningful and rich conversation between them. Which leads us to ask, you know, because they meet as research partners at that point, how is research made collaborative? Which is essentially the same question as how can we connect with others as a professional practice? Um, and in this case, Lisa and I are actually collaborating as educators, um, simply uh, this is just a beautiful opportunity to actually not stay in our silos because um, staying in silos just doesn't help us in this complex world. Um, but also students have the opportunity to be contributors of knowledge. And that is really powerful. Um, we actually believe that a purposeful contribution to society is made in thousands of little moves. And in here, they have the ability to uh, um, contribute to society society by um, finding and filling the gaps in design history and also finding uh, and supporting information and supporting underrepresented uh, identities uh, from a historical point of view. Um, at the same time, they are identifying the interdependent relationships uh, between uh, people, places, objects, uh, and in a really complex uh, system uh, within physical, social, uh, cultural, technological, and economic effects. Um, and finally, they're able to just connect as a human being and practice their whole human skills, uh, which means that they can uh, develop their high uh, quality of interpersonal skills um, and just find out friends, maybe. So in this context, they are using system thinking, right? Just in doing research and writing about it and reflecting about it. But we really wanted to go beyond this. Uh, we really believe that uh, writing is seeing, but visualizing it has a powerful uh, effect in the sense that we can all understand it and we can all uh, stimulate it um, with uh, storytelling, activating typography and voice uh, so that it can be easily shared. So in this project, they had three main outcomes. Um, they had to first um, write an annotated bibliography of at least 10 authoritative sources. Uh, we wanted really to visualize this in a manner that could be compiled in a collective way. So we asked them to design spreads in a printed book um, that we would compile. And then uh, the idea is to create a symposium uh, that they would brand entirely. 
And the idea of this symposium is to make it available as a public resource uh, for everybody. That this project doesn't stop at you know a class assignment or just between the 42 people and that we are, but it can be really open to the world. Um, and it also gives a really rare opportunity for undergrad students to have a platform to speak, which uh, we feel like is often left to grad students uh, at the minimum or professionals. In this beautiful experiment that we're conducting in here, uh, we started with so many expectations just because Lisa and I are both uh, very excited people about this project. And then some of these expectations weren't necessarily met uh, in the sense that we faced challenges. Uh, the first one is about communication. Uh, we thought that it actually was harder than expected to just, you know, uh, jump up and, uh, and and connect with students, um, students between themselves. Uh, like uh, some of them had this fear of reaching out, didn't necessarily know how to do this. And you know, just in general, everyday life struggles um, made it a bit harder or more challenging to reach out for someone. And then once they did, they were like, wow, that other person is so nice. It was like a surprise, you know? Um, so that was kind of funny and unexpected. Um, at the same time, uh, Lisa and I have asynchronous classes in the sense that we are not teaching at the same time uh, and it would have been so much easier to just connect all together uh, in, uh, you know, a full sessions. Um, so that's definitely a challenge. Um, another one is about uh, their speed of curiosity uh, in the sense that some uh, students started, you know, like right away and just started digging in the research, super excited. And some other students were just very uh, fearful of starting um, and waited for their uh, partners um, or just didn't start, you know, just at the very late time. And that was also very surprising to us, uh, but it was a good reminder that learning is not just a button that you click on. And finally, uh, another uh, challenge was about defining what story means, which can be understood in a very romantic way. Um, but, uh, you know, we had a couple of students just asking us, uh, what do you mean it's about storytelling? Uh, is it, you know, like telling a story like Cinderella story or is it more a narrative? Um, and so that was, you know, surprising, but also enriching. Along the way, we had so many happy surprises. Uh, for instance, uh, beautiful friendships just started. I mean, here we have a student just uh, thanking me uh, for uh, finding a friend who likes K-pop, um, which is really cool on top of, you know, connecting uh, deeply uh, in the project. Um, some of them are actually using uh, now online libraries, for instance, which was uh, new to them or like buying uh, books because they think it's uh, worth it to buy, uh, which means that they're expanding their ways of seeing. And that is really a win uh, in this uh, entire experience. And finally, uh, we really believe um, in the power that students can be contributors of knowledge so that we're not just the educators, you know, just passing knowledge to them. It's really just common. And so that makes a more inclusive and horizontal environment. Um, and we believe that this could be the future of design education. So I'll leave you with Lisa, who will uh, show you some exciting examples of student research that is that are still in progress. Thanks, Dina. Yeah, we're in the throes of the project. We're at the end of October in the middle midpoint of our fall semesters. Um, but the students have started to find and, and dig into some things that have been intriguing them. So um, the format of the project uh, asks the students to see themselves as researchers, um, as creative historians in graphic design histories. Um, and the crux of the ask that we and the prompt that we brought to the students is to focus in on one story and participate in retelling this history from an inclusive point of view. They might start um, in a variety of places, but um, but they they must land in a place where together they tell a story. Um, 
So for example, um, a few things that have come up in the research so far. Uh, Adam and Abby were particularly uh, taken by a talk on the Javanese language uh, during type weekend in September. And that talk led them to be curious about other scripts um, that they had not seen before. Um, the, uh, the Javanese presentation brought them to look at Thai, Hebrew, other Aramaic and Cyrillic scripts. It's been really exciting to see them find a whole trove of typographic vocabularies in all of these different language spaces. For McKenna and Anna, they started out looking at jazz album covers and through their research of, of finding out who was behind the artwork of many of these um, particularly famous musicians' albums, they wondered, did these white designers work to include black artists? Um, who were the black artists that were most active during this time? And where were they in relation to the music world? McKenna and Anna are also looking at how jazz covers in different countries, um, even the same music can be visualized and, uh, and interpreted in different ways and how this might relate to that work. During their research process, they've had a few sprints and exercises that have helped them stretch and look to connect the things that they're looking closely at and connect out into the world. Rebecca and Jalung uh, we're looking at Cuban design very closely. And so in the Six Degrees of Connection project, they were asked to try to go as far out as they could from their original reference point and still have a strong connection between each of those degrees. So beginning with Cuba and moving to Milton Glaser and, and Push, Pushpin Studios and the influence that influences that they were looking at as well as who they influenced with their illustration work. That work led them to psychedelic typefaces and fonts, especially in the influence of Art Nouveau and surrealist work on the 1960s and 70s poster designs for music. That geographics point led them to underground comics, Zap comics in particular, both for their satirical and um, and uh, sort of ra raucous um, contemporary uh, takes on social issues which led them to women's comics, which were started in direct opposition to some of those earlier comics. And women's comics led them to looking at uh, lowbrow art and Juxtapose magazine and the, hist and the long history of that contemporary space. Looking at or using Miro as a way to collaborate and um, corroborate on how the work that they've been looking at connects both in linear forms in uh, the timeline exercise above, as well as beginning to think about how we might think of graphic design histories as more of a nodal, uh, nodal network. What are different ways that we can arrange and think about um, and, and utilize the connections between work. Um, so thinking about uh, not only the creative work of of being inspired by the work, uh, finding and seeking the work, as well as different ways of seeing and arranging those, those works in relation to one another to find stories and find other things that connect with um, the, the points that they are uh, very curious about. One piece we've been thinking about throughout this project is how we navigate feedback with the students. For example, one common uh, type of way of starting might be thinking of, of a pretty famous designer, Louise Feely, who we all know and admire. Um, there's quite a bit of resources out there that um, lead students to that. And how do we how do we break uh, how do we use that as a as a as a as a useful starting point um, and get somewhere that we might not expect? So, for example, here we might talk about how Louise Feely collects um, an extraordinary, um, has an extraordinary collection of Italian ephemera, and that is a huge part of um, her and her studio's practice. Um, so thinking about how collections and references um, directly from particular geographic and cultural spaces might be inspiring for a designer. That might lead us to a conversation about different kinds of ephemera um, and the kinds of things that we've produced and made along the way, things that were never meant to be kept forever, but were meant to be shared, um, whether it be packaging or postcards um, or other paper goods. 
So that conversation might lead us to thinking about um, Victorian uh, book uh, book uh, um, covers and illustrations that and that leads us to looking at postcards uh, out of out of the UK. And um, this particular postcard in this discussion led us to an image of Bangalore, which then led us to a conversation about what kind of design might be in India, um, looking at references like type on earth um, and um, other maybe sort of less, less uh, official sources um, to see how it is that uh, people were observing typography um, in different kinds of spaces around the world. Um, and that space might lead us to looking for other um, other resources that are looking specifically at ephemera, um, the India ephemera project, then led the student to uh, looking at matchboxes and ephemera in a really different part of the world. So we love that this project can begin with what we know um, and help lead through and both away and more intimately into um, a different part of the graphic design sort of sphere and world. So because design is iterative by definition, uh, we're constantly thinking about ways to improve uh, this project. Um, and one of them is to actually be really deliberate um, and kind of uh, set a toolkit on how to uh, contact someone, how to meet someone, uh, maybe how to write an email just to facilitate uh, this very first uh, uh, contact making um, um, step. Uh, so that they can meet their research partner and feel at ease doing so. Uh, we also think that at the very beginning, together with the students, we should define words like diversity, inclusivity, uh, story in relation to history, so that we're all on the same um, line and um, we also had multiple uh, experiences uh, that were really beautiful along the way. One of them was to create collaborative slides uh, where everybody just actually popped their research uh, in these collective slides. And they were so successful and so inspiring for everybody that we think that these kind of practices should be brought also up from the very beginning so that everybody can start uh, and feel at ease doing so. Um, in the near future, uh, we would love to create a step-by-step -step process so that other educators uh, can join us in um, filling the gaps of the history uh, in a visual way as well. Um, and so that this could be shared in a single space and kind of create a collective in that sense. Um, we also would like to experiment um, a bit more. Uh, and that means that there shall be uh, more considerations next time. Um, yeah, because we're all mini archivists, we're all mini historians, we're all collectors and curious um, design people. And ultimately, we all have a part of this inclusive history, both in telling it, in seeking it, in looking for it, and in sharing it with others. Um, and we ask all of you um, who are with us tonight, um, how do you contribute to the making of histories of graphic design more inclusive, both in your work and practice and teaching? And in the meantime, obviously, you are invited to come to the symposium. So please come and join us on December 7th and December 8th from 4.30 to 6 uh, p.m. EST. Uh, we're going to just drop uh, a link uh, on uh, the chat so that if you're interested, you can email us your uh, contact information and we will share with you everything you need to know about this uh, so that you can join us for real. Thank you so, so much uh, for everybody who is listening and for the organizers to have us tonight. And thank you, Lisa, for doing this together. Um, we're so excited to hear from you now. Thank you, everyone. I think I'm just going to stop sharing so that I can actually see the screen. <laughs> Yeah, so the chat can feel free to communicate and just, yeah, uh, express your opinion, share what are you, what is your experience from this presentation. I personally think that it is it was really wonderful because it's always 
very interesting to see like this uh, inside of how teachers are organizing and designing their courses and like in particular for me as a student yeah it's also like this the, the other side of uh, of the uh, of the situation and uh, yeah it was really great and i loved your idea how you present this uh, uh, this uh, part of the research because it's actually the first thing you're going to do and it sets the start the beginning of your project it uh, i don't know sets the mood and uh, yeah the fact that you're also putting a lot of visual part into that it's really great. We also practice that in our academy and we have, uh, for example, such thing as the visual diary. Uh, so every time we are even having some practical lectures, we are encouraged like to uh, think visually and to draw this, to feel, to sense and just to train our our hands. Yeah, how, how to do that, like not only using the usual language, but the visual, of course, as well. And yeah, it's, I was also, would really like to compliment you that uh, you're really paying attention to the team building uh, because a lot of the students, yes, they are shy indeed and uh, they, uh, I don't know, sometimes uh, hesitate and asking to participate in their project or just, I don't know, to, to stick to some group. So when teachers are taking that in their hands, that's really great and I don't know, just uh, you're so initiative and that, that's, that's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much thank for you. my words. <laughs> yeah, thank you for all those comments. No, it's true. <laughs> yeah, fostering and fostering connections with people outside of the school network, right? I mean, in a way, you sort of get to know your friends and all of this. So in a way, at both anonymizing and, and connecting with someone who really has almost nothing to do with your life in any way, aside from this project, we thought might be an interesting way to, to expand. Uh, the student experience. Or they actually find out that they love K-pop. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's also interesting how it looks from the teacher's perspective, uh, because, for example, when we are having like workshops uh, and uh, yeah, we are we are working in teams and we always have this backup of the teacher. And uh, it's fun how it looks from his perspective, because uh, the teacher just observed mm -hmm. this, this group of people who are trying to I don't know, may up with them to come up with some ideas. Uh, and uh, yeah, they're mostly like just guiding and uh, I don't know, helping us, supporting us. Uh, and uh, I, I have no idea how many variations of different ideas of like of interpretations of one topic you've seen because how many students come through your lectures? How many students just come through one topic? And how many different and various uh, I don't know, uh, results you can achieve with that? <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's in a way, it's both there's so things in common, but also always something new. You know, there's always because every student is a different yeah. person and they come with all of the things that they've done and thought about and love. Um, so I think fostering that is a huge part of connecting any of this information to that person's practice. Yeah. I guess it's getting like pretty complicated now to communicate and just to keep up with everything uh, while we have to just, know, handle with this uh, virtual uh, virtual parts uh, because uh, I don't know I don't remember last time me sitting in the group like of people and uh, studying together uh, because the academies are closed but yeah <laughs> handling with what we can in many ways it is true but i think we're all sharing the same pain point which is being zoomed out all day yeah. um, and so we have this point in common that everybody is experiencing in you know um different ways uh depending on our intersections in here but we definitely have a similar pain point uh and so connecting isn't as hard in the sense that Remembering that we're humans uh, is important in this process. Um, yeah, I believe, but I'm a big idealist, so. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's but it's so important. It's yeah, the it's a person. It's everybody's a everybody is a is a human person who's growing and changing and and thinking and 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 um and hurting and connecting and wa wants and seeks to connect. And I think more than ever. Um, yeah, we can't take for granted how much that supports so much of the rest of what we do and think about. Um, 
you know, and how to make these sort of like both light, light connections, academic connections, like emotional connections, it's all of those things add up and are helpful. Yeah, recently uh, students uh, were attending the workshop and they were exploring a very interesting thing. Like uh, the topic was yeah, mostly connected to the current situation which we have now. And uh, one of the topics were like exploring actually the physic lack of physical contact, like something that we lost, like how it all changed uh, the, when we reduced everything to cameras, microphones, and how it uh, influenced our privacy, how it influenced our sense of the world, uh, just like our, yeah, our sensation. Uh, and uh, one group of students, they did a very interesting project that like they used the uh, the effect of Schlieren, like which is used in the photography, which allows you to see the differences in the air temperatures. And uh, they were able to, with this construction, they were able to visualize the warmth of the human bodies because, like our bodies, also they produce they, 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 their temperature is warmer than the temperature of the air. So if you just put your arm in that, I don't know, just do something like that, or hug, or shake hands, or just do some human interactions, you can see visually the heat like like the warmth and it was like very beautiful idea i guess and a you know, very interesting uh, interpretation and like the, the way they presented it, it it was great i love that i actually experienced something similar uh when doing meditation like guided meditation in group um so this idea of just doing this you know and so that that kind of form um, similarly uh interesting that it's used also in photography i didn't know that <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 it is uh, like uh, it's the construction actually is pretty simple like it uses the camera light source of light mirror like a little bit special one like concave mirror or something like that and the blade and you just i don't know have fun <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, let's see how is it going. Our our support team like is here trying to handle and and to, <laughs> to, 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 to have everything under control, but it's pretty uh, hard. I don't know. You're probably now located in, in New York, right? So actually, New York, the state. Ah, oh, okay. <laughs> because, yeah. because we are in Warsaw and it's almost 2 a.m. <laughs> oh, good. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I'm looking yeah. at the participants list. I'm wondering if it's a, what kind of mix we have. So I don't know if um, you want to talk or if anybody out there has any sort of like thoughts about how they. Yeah, yeah. So just uh, people from the. Yeah, from the yeah. conversation, uh, feel free to use the chat and I don't know, just uh, uh, read something. What do you think about the conference, uh, about the session? I don't know, maybe share some experience uh, about the uh, teaching practices you liked uh, while you were studying or maybe you were a teacher yourself. We don't know what kind of audience we're having here. <clears throat> Chat is supposed to, you can use the Q and I section or just the usual room chat. It doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, one question I have just as far as I mean, I don't know for for Dina too is as we've been compiling this together. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think in a way it sort of acted as like a type of way to reflect on our process so far. So in some ways, as we as we sort of iterate, even as we're going along this semester, it's been exciting to be able to sort of have some of that spontaneousness, which I think maybe just speaking of sort of the things that we lose when, we, when we're not all in a class together, I think there's kind of like a quickness and sort of like a, not a speed, but a quickness of transformation that happens. So that feels like it happens so easily when everyone is the same room. And I think just through this project, I've been looking for ways, you know, with the students, like how can we sort of transform or expand um, digitally um, and in some way quickly together, um, uh, you know, on whether it's Miro or um, using slide decks and things like this. So it's been, it's been fun to kind of figure out like what kinds of things 
do that? What kinds of things do accelerate that kind of curiosity? Um, so, you know, in a way, I hope that, um, yeah, we are able to sort of like keep encouraging our students to keep sort of both finding new things, but also uh, finding something to, to, to pinpoint. Because uh, even telling this story today, I think it sort of showed us kind of a, another example of how how a, how a story can sort of help us see something. I mean, definitely. I think I love this project just also because it's a complete experiment. Like we've been building and iterating and building and iterating, you know, uh, along the process, um, and also co-designing with students, you know, in many ways. Um, I definitely think Miro is a lifesaver. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay, we have one question here uh, from Sajet Poetras. Sorry if I pronounced the thing incorrectly. Uh, so, do you have any thoughts about our current historic era? Mm. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I think today, um, when we worked, we worked on that the um, that timeline sort of exercise today, just as a way to have some conversations about um, the, the the readings we've been doing, and. Um, and they put they they put us or one of the students put a screenshot of something they had made just in the past class like an hour before, um, and it was they were looking they were working on Figma and um, and uh, doing an exercise with their other professor and um, so I don't know if there's something about kind of the, the maybe the the immediate contemporary contemporariness of the image that seems sort of like maybe like ripe for uh, being able to sort of so immediately put alongside. You know, a poster by Tibor Kalman, um, and um, in a way, kind of see themselves as part of this timeline. I think I don't know if that is about our current era, but I think we're able to see ourselves, able to quickly see ourselves in context with other pictures, and sort of seeing the students sort of both do that. Of, of course, in jest. I mean, it's a little bit of a joke, right? I mean, they just made it an hour ago, and it was sort of a joke image, but. Um, but it felt valid and felt kind of like, yeah, it's it's part of it's 2012 or 2020, and that's that's where we are now, and this image exists, and so here it is. Um, yeah. So there's, Sorry. Oh, no, no. <laughs> At the beginning, when we were introducing the project, uh, you know, we encouraged them to also look at their. Uh, immediate uh, influences and just go on Instagram and go on Pinterest and go in places where they actually already are, uh, which is kind of unconventional when you're thinking uh, of research and academic research. But it's also starting today of what are my influences and how can I dig deeper in there um, and kind of build this tree of research, you know? Um, yeah, it's like you might start with an image that you think like just looks cool, looks beautiful of some like, you know, type installation somewhere like unlabeled, like hardly given any context, but sort of like, well, then how do we begin to find out about about that specifically or what things does that remind us of or where it is, where was that geographically or just from the rest of that person's um, Instagram, like what, where do they seem to be? What, how do they seem to see themselves? Um, so how can that information kind of become data to then sort of be creative with? Um, so maybe I don't know if that's if it defines our our current era, but I think the sort of the ability to contextualize, recontextualize, and um, maybe see the immediacy of of how how an image's context changes. Mm -hmm. um, I think maybe is part of what we'll we'll see when we when we look back, you know, twenty fifty years from now. Yeah, it's yeah. At the same time, I feel like everything is really connected. So um, yeah. present, past future, everything is kind of merged together in many ways. Uh, it's not like there is a clear separation, but whatever is built or designed today is still influenced by what was in the past and what will be coming in the future. Yeah, okay, so we have another question from Dermot McCormick. Pros and cons yeah. of Pinterest. Everyone going to the same well and how to broaden that exploration. I mean, I feel like Pinterest can be a start. It's really just to ignite the curiosity. It's not, you know, an official resource by any, uh, you know, way in here. But it's more like making them feel at ease that research is not this crazy uh, 
thing that we imagine in uh, academia, you know? Like we can start in small places and in places that we feel comfortable about. And then once that curiosity is ignited, then we can move forward and explore further resources that are more uh, authoritative, right, and official. Um, but it is it just important to make them feel at ease with the idea of researching, especially when you're talking to an audience of designers uh, who are used to visualize things all the time um, that are not necessarily in context uh, of history or culture or you know anything um, and so this is a super important exercise um, yeah yeah no I would definitely just add to that I mean I think I mean even just you know snapshot two or three years ago if a student was like oh like I found us on Pinterest be like all right design inspiration Pinterest like just off the table gone done um like doesn't tell you anything it's just like it's just a mood board and you know it just keeps you on a superficial level and just keeps you in that just sort of traps you <laughs> into that and I think now I think I I mean um I think the way that we advise our students sort of like through and out and away from that space is so critical because they are tools. They're interesting and they're useful. And um, it can even just going through an endless scroll in a way, it's kind of a, a strange type of research. Um, uh, and maybe sort of feels passive or can can be passive or it can be a really active and activating and generating space. And I think it's, it's more like this attitude around like where where that where that research headspace can come with you, um, and that sort of like any place becomes a site of research, and that it's that it's useful that way. And Pinterest is just one of um, of of so so many and so many many more. Um, so so yeah, I think a good question. Yeah, it is really a good question, and I think it's also deep rooted in what we believe research is, uh, or yeah. how we wanted to tackle research in this project with Lisa. Yeah. Um, so nothing really is uh, is to be disregarded. Everything yeah. to be insightful and inspiring. Yeah. I think also, I mean, we didn't really talk about this specifically, but like the research methods of you know going through an image and kind of you know breaking it down by semiotics, right? Or or being able to like look at say what are the attributes of this image right now and mm -hmm. be able to see it as an object, be able to see it as the content, to be able to see it as like what it evokes for you, um, and to be able to parse those different ways of reading it, and that there's different data to um, to appreciate from it. Um, at those at those points and being able to sort of see the differences between what kind of lens you put on it um, and then how useful that that reference point can be. Um, and I think that relates to, you know, how you might search for something be after that. It's sort of like what 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 words, what descriptions, um, what things you notice about the image that might help you find, um, whether it be other images or other language that um, might expand that space. I mean, we have a pair, uh, uh, like a part, uh, a pair. We can't say a pair. <laughs> we have a pair who are looking, who started looking uh, in Pinterest actually uh, on environmental types. So like just giant type put in environments um, and uh, which they called, you know, instinctively architectural type, which is really interesting to just see you know how they can define things and how they see it from their own perspective um and then they actually dig deeper uh, to find out you know well from this particular visual that really inspired us how can we find more historical uh um expressions of uh these uh examples and how can we extend it to multiple places in the world and how does actually type in the environment works in different countries uh in their environment um so in that sense i feel like that was a, a successful starting point <laughs> Yeah, definitely. No, I, I love that trajectory too. And and also, I mean, where the the student in that pair that's on on in my class, I I think there was a moment where um, they expressed, you know, oh, like I there, there's I want to know more, but it like doesn't say anything <laughs> about it. Sort of like right because it is has been decontextualized <laughs> from this useful place. So being able to even feel that to like feel like they want to understand better, more, more thoroughly, um, and to have that. To have that sort of, you know, I guess, in a way, sort of a sense of of how to how to wonder about something, um, rather than to be satisfied with whatever they receive. Like they know that there's different ways that they could receive it or could have could have found it. 
That's such an important point that you're bringing, Lisa. And ultimately, it comes back to the title of our presentation, which is Seeking Plural Narratives. Uh, and in here, we just, you know, uh, just really enjoy the ways in which everybody is looking at things in different ways and have just different point of views and perspectives. Um, I honestly think this project has been so enriching for me. Uh, personally, uh, for the students and also for Lisa, I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to speak for yourself, but yeah, I mean, I just think, uh, just discovering this multiplicity, um, is really humbling also in many ways. Yeah. Yeah. And this connection point too, just the, I mean, and meeting, meeting you, Dina, in a way, like that's been really, really lovely. And like through this being also like a way to expand, like, how do we, um, think about and talk about, you know, who we are in relation to our students, how we, how we want to believe in this work and how do we embody, you know, the, in a way sort of like model, model that kind of partnership or that kind of attitude around research. So I think that's been a really useful part. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Virtual high five. <laughs> yeah. High five. Okay. Okay. Uh, girls. So usually our sessions like for, for about an hour and uh, yeah, so our just like cross that line so i don't know maybe a couple of last minutes if uh, oh, okay so we have one uh last, okay let it be the last question so oh, will the recording do, will be available for you later yes it will be uh you will always be able to come back to all the recordings of the sessions of this exhibition so don't worry uh, you can just go to the agenda and check like uh, for for the new uh, sessions you can just join them and for the ones which uh, are best you can just uh, come back later and watch the recording it will be already uploaded there okay so yeah thank you a lot really for a great session for a great mood at this uh, late night time <laughs> yes it's just some energy boost to that. i don't know i know i can work a couple of more hours <laughs> yeah well, thank, thank you so, so much, much. For, yeah thank you so much for having us thank you everyone for the questions sure. and for being here um yeah we're excited to be able to share the space with you yeah. Thank you for being our moderator too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, always to your service. Okay.